Yeah, 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 not together with prayers. Amen. All right, we got Brother Mike going to open us in prayer tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this time together to learn more about you, Father. And uh, bless everyone around in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, brother. Amen. You know, um, the demonstration of a life of prayer. This is the topic that the Lord gave me today to speak on is a life of prayer. Not just a moment of prayer, but what does a life of prayer look like? You know, there's times that we pray out of desperation. There's times that we pray out of great gratitude. There's times that we pray, um, you know, um, in conversation with God, you know, thanking him and asking him questions about um, life. Because we know that he has the answers. As believers, we pray to a living God. Okay? We pray to a God who is able to hear and also to respond to us in different ways. And it all has to do with our positioning ourselves with God in a life of prayer. It might not happen this very moment. But whatever you pray according to his heart and that is pleasing to God and according to his purpose in due season, you'll see it play out and get and the prayer will be answered. Okay? But we need to be in the right heart condition. You know, we got to come to God in prayer with a heart that has surrendered to his will, even if it causes some of the things that we desire to have to be stripped away from us so that he can fill it with his desire. And all of a sudden, his desire becomes our desire. And when our prayer comes to him, it's pleasing to him what we ask of him. Remember the part of scripture that says, you have not for you ask not. And that, that which you ask, you ask amiss, or you're asking the wrong things. You ask for things to entertain your, your fleshly desires, he says. But anything you ask according to the Father's will in Jesus' name, according to the purpose of God, God is faithful to answer it and to perform it for you. Praise God. You know, so it's not just talking with God, it's knowing in what manner to come before God, to walk with God humbly, and not as an entitled child who thinks he owes you something. He's already given you more than you deserve. <laughs> How many of you know that, <laughs> right? who are not worthy of even deserving of the things that he's given us, even though life has had its trials and its tribulations. He still graced us with faith and eternal, the promise of eternal life and a personal uh, conversation that, that continues throughout all eternity with him and also one another of the family of faith. And so we're gonna, I'm going to start with... Um, Speaking of being in, constant, in a constant prayer lifestyle, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 through 22, it reads this. It says, And we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, Comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all people. Okay? It says, see that no one renders evil or returns evil for evil to anyone. But always pursue what is good, both for yourselves and for all. Okay? So it's talking about lifting each other up. It's talking about praying for each other. It's talking about loving each other. It's talking about being patient one with another. And not just in a general way, but in a sincere way, okay? Not just when it's convenient for me, but when it is applicable to somebody else's benefit, okay? That's what we as, as ministers one unto another are. We're, we're, to, we're to hold each other in higher regard than our own selves, the Bible says. Esteem others above ourselves. And that's basically saying, be humble and be considerate of other people. Don't be inconsiderate of other people. If you're going to represent Jesus, you can't run around being inconsiderate and rude to people. Because why? Because it doesn't ruin your testimony. People are going to forget who you are when you leave the room. But they're going to blame it on Jesus. They're going to blame it on Christianity. They're going to blame it on our faith. They're going to say their faith is no different than the world because they're as mean to us as the world are. 
They don't act any different. But the only way that you build that character is by having a constant prayer life with God. And then it flows over into our relationship one with another. And it isn't just a program to entertain you. Okay? I love the songs. I love the, I love the events. I love all that stuff. But most of all, I love the word of God. And I love his people. I love to help people. That's my heart. I like to help people. I don't care if you're rich, you're poor, you're weak, you're strong, you're good looking, you're ugly. I don't know. Uh, whatever you are. I want to help you. My heart is to help you. My heart is to lead you closer to Jesus and tell you that you're loved and that you matter and that you're important and that your life counts for something. More than this world could ever tell you, your life counts to God himself. If it didn't, he wouldn't have sent Jesus to die for us. <laughs> you know, we're very precious to God. And so here in verse 16, I'm going to finish this, this uh, in verse 16. It says... Um, Rejoice always. 17 says, pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Okay? So this is what it is for me and for you. I'll go over it again. 16 says, rejoice. Rejoice always. Always have a light spirit. Always rejoice because you know that your salvation is nearer now than it was before. Every moment we live, another day, we're closer to meeting Jesus. Isn't that amazing? You know, so that's pretty exciting. You know, we're about to go visit family and be a part of a very sacred, um, holy matrimony of marriage. And I'm very excited. I'm very excited. But I can't even imagine how exciting it's going to be when I'm coming before the Lord in eternity. And, and I, I, I'm preparing myself uh, for that day. And any time that I'm struggling, I can rejoice because I can focus again on my relationship with God through prayer. Okay? And I can have a direct line to the Father through Jesus Christ by the leaving of the Holy Spirit. And a conversation that is filled with life and filled with confidence and filled with peace and humility and joy. Okay? Regardless of what's going on in the world around me. And so... I want you to really take that into perspective, individually and corporately as the body of Christ, um, that there is great rejoicing in knowing of the Lord's salvation, okay? Because someday all the sorrow and pain and disappointments of this world are going to fade away. <laughs> and the answers to everything that, that we need are going to become so much clearer and so much applicable. You know, when we think about heaven and where our conversation of prayer takes us in, in faith and, and when we think about heaven, the destiny that we have with God, the plan that he has for us, we should rejoice because we know certain parts of the scripture give us a little bit of a glimpse about what it's going to be like. There will be no sorrow there. There will be no hunger there won't even need to be a sun in the sky because the glory of God, the glory from Jesus Christ, the glory of the Spirit of the Lord will light all of heaven. I mean, that, that's just a barely just a little, a little glimpse of the glory that awaits us. And that's amazing. It gives me and it, gives, it should give all believers a reason to rejoice to rejoice and to, to remind one another of these promises that God has made to the household of faith. And so here it says, do not despise. It says, to rejoice always, excuse me, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks. Okay? So part of prayer is being thankful. You know, a lot of times in prayer, I thank God. I begin my prayer with, thank you, Lord. Thank you for salvation. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for loving me. Thank you for taking the time and for pouring out your heart towards me and surrounding me with your word and your people to the degree that you do so that I'm inspired to follow you no matter what comes. So that when the storms of life come or the raging wars of men arise, I can find rejoicing and peace in my relationship with Jesus Christ. And that takes a conversation. How many of you know that you're, 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 any relationship you have, if you don't communicate, it will suffer? Okay? There's some days 
that, that, that I get busy and I got to remind myself to tell my wife when she's walking by, hey, hey, honey, hey. And she, she's busy too. She, she likes to stay busy. And she goes by and I'm like, hey, I love you. you know? Or hey, sit down for a minute right here. But what do you want, honey? I just want you to sit down for me. I need to be close to you. Okay? And she goes, oh, sweetie, and everything, and pats me on the shoulder like I'm three sometimes. And, uh, you know, and it warms my heart. And then I'm like, okay, go ahead. Go do what you got to do. You know? And then Sarah, she goes, you know, doing her thing. And so, you know, but, you know, God wants that to, to be how we relate to him too. Sometimes he wants us just to sit and be still and know that he is God. And say, Lord, I'm just taking a minute to put my focus back to the conversation that is most important in my life, the conversation that I have with God in prayer. And so it, it's this, this speaks of um, praying without ceasing. I'm always talking to God. I really am. And that's what it is. It's a conversation. I'll be talking to you guys here, and all of a sudden the Spirit of the Lord drops something in my spirit, and I'll convey it to you. And sometimes I'll just think it and go, oh, wow, Lord, that's awesome. And it, and it reminds me of different things that he said in his word. Or he reminds me of um, just how much he cares for me and how amazing he is. Sometimes I'll just be looking out into the sky and see the great creation of God, and he'll speak to me through it. You know, I'm always aware of it uh, and acknowledging God, even in the struggle. You know, when I'm struggling, I acknowledge, guess what, Lord, you have an answer for this. Let me seek you, Lord. Whether it's through your word or your word and prayer or a combination of things or just taking a walk and talking with you, Lord, until I have the peace that only you can give me. And then I can continue on my day and be productive and have an impact on, on the kingdom of God. And it doesn't have to be a big old demonstrative thing. It can just be simply going out with a great attitude and seeing somebody who looks a little sad and go and say, hey, brother, God bless you. Hey, sister. Hey, how you doing? Praise God. God bless you. Have a blessed day. That's it. It's a lifestyle. It creates a lifestyle. Our conversation with God is to create a lifestyle for us here that represents him. That's the most important thing you'll ever do in your life is represent the Lord as a believer. That's what you're called to do. That's how you evangelize. That's how you do the work of an evangelist. As you be the light of Jesus Christ in a dark world. You allow him to light you up and send you out into this world with the gospel of peace. A word of encouragement. A word of hope. A prayer of faith. And you'll see God do miraculous things in our lives. And so here, it says, giving thanks in everything, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies or the preaching of the word. Test all things and hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Okay, so it, it's saying here that through our conversation and our prayer, then we develop a relationship and we develop convictions that causes us to sustain from every form of evil. Now, what that looks like can be a, a, a variation of many things. Sometimes evil's happening that isn't coming from you or from me. It might be an environment of people that are just caught up in wicked stuff. Stay away from it. Protect the anointing. And if you do go there, take a witness with you so that accountability can be there and you can conduct yourself well and you can lead them to the Lord and not fall into temptation. Believe me, I know what I'm talking about because I've done it many times. But we're learning. That's part of growing. You're not going to experience anything. You're not going to learn how to ride a bike without scraping your foot or, you know, scraping your knee a couple of times. <laughs> right? But before you know it, you're riding that bike, man. You're jumping ramps. You're doing all kinds of stuff. Your mama told you you better be careful not to do. <laughs> and you, but you're pretty good on that bike. It's the same thing with a prayer life. It's the same thing with learning from our mistakes. 
It's the same thing learning from other people's mistakes. Okay? It, it's a process. But it is a process that causes us to undergo the change that comes through a life of prayer and a life of obedience to God. And so here, we're going to go on um, in Luke, talking about being fervent and in persistent prayer. It says, Then he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart, saying, There was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him saying, Get justice for me from my adversary, and he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I do not fear God nor regard men, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she wearies me. Now he's talking about this woman that went to a judge for help. One of the words that defines God is the judge. Okay, God the Father is the judge of all the universe. Okay, but see, he's a loving father. It's one thing to go to a judge that's a stranger to you. It's another thing when the judge is your daddy. <laughs> it's another thing when the judge is our father in heaven. And see, this judge that wasn't really in any way connected to her emotionally, he said, and he thought to himself, well, you know what, I'm just going to help her because if not, she's going to keep coming and it's going to might, might become a little bit annoying for her because she was persistent. And this is the parable that Jesus is using. He's saying, if you stay persistent, don't think that God is slack in performing that which he promised. But be persistent and consistent in pursuing God in prayer. Believing him. And trusting him. That he's heard your prayer. And that he will answer. Because he's a loving God. Loves you so much he sent Jesus to die for us. So he's going to be more considerate of you than this, this earthly judge was. For that woman and this earthly judge in this parable that Jesus is speaking um, he tells a story of how this judge just you know he said okay I'm gonna I'm gonna avenge this woman so praise God hey hey Jimmy God bless you Primo, how you doing <laughs> hey and uh, so uh, here He's speaking about to be in fervent and persistent in our prayer life, okay? Not just when we need something, but just in conversation with God. Saying, Lord, we love you. Lord, show me, um, show, show me what it is to experience more of you in my life. And thank you, Lord, for all the goodness. Thank you for my family. Thank you for my loved ones and my friends. And, and Lord, thank you for making it possible so that when I go by somebody who's maybe homeless or hurting, um, that I can have a way to maybe help them a little bit. It might not fix their whole life, but it gives them hope. You know? To live in a way that is not self-seeking. In a way that is saying, you know what, Lord? I I'll do whatever it, it is you ask me to do to serve your people and to serve you and to express to them that the only reason that I do these certain things is because of my faith in Jesus Christ and because Jesus told me that this is the way I should live. To be loving and kind and to look after the widow and the orphan. Praise God. And so here um, we're going to continue. In Matthew 6, 6, now it says have it speaks of having private and intimate prayer time with God. Okay, so it's not just that we pray for each other here in public or whatever, however the Lord leads us as we walk through life. But it says that, that uh, when we pray, go into your room and when you have shut your door, pray to your father who is in the secret place. And your father who sees you in secret will reward you openly or publicly. Okay. So um, it speaks of having a private prayer life with God that is very effective to the rest of our lives. 
Other people won't see it, but you know, when, when it's happening, when, when we're going through the process and building that relationship and that intimacy with God, but all of a sudden, in one way or another, they will see it openly. God will reward you, even in front of your enemies. It says that he has prepared a table in the presence of our enemy. Okay? We know that our enemy is not going to be in the eternal kingdom of God in the third heaven. The enemy is here in this world. But God can bless you even in the presence of your enemy. Why? Because, because God wants them to get saved too. And when they see the blessing of God upon your life, then maybe somebody who was as lost as I was, or maybe even more, maybe not even as lost as I was, who hasn't given their life to Jesus, will see the testimony of Jesus and say, you know what? If, if God can save Martin and if God can use Martin, you know what? He can use me too. What's that all about? Maybe I should talk to brother so-and-so with this and that and see what that's about. And all of a sudden, you're building treasures in heaven. And all of a sudden, he who was your enemy becomes like the good Samaritan. You become like the good Samaritan. When his priest passed him by, when his fellow man passed him by, the Samaritan stopped and helped the man and took him to the inn. You know the story. He paid and he said, I pay for everything that he needs bandage him up, feed him and everything, and when I come back, if he owes you anything, put it on my account, and I'll pay for it. This was supposed to be the enemy of the Jewish people, but it was a Samaritan that helped them. That's the impact that God puts through his spirit in our lives for other people. See, I don't care if you're a drug addict. I don't care if you're a drunk. I don't care if you're a prostitute. I don't care if you're a homosexual. I don't care if you are a murderer. Jesus can heal your life. Jesus can save you from eternal hellfire. The gospel of Jesus Christ is very powerful. And it's very true. And it's very faithful. The sword of the spirit, the very word of God. <laughs> Praise God. He equips us. Part of the equipping and staying equipped is a fervent, consistent prayer life. See, I go and I talk to people through the day and we talk about a lot of other things. But you know what? I spend most of my time with my mind on praying to God. I'm kind of a weirdo that way. That's how I fit in with God. He called peculiar people. That's how I'm peculiar. One of the ways I'm peculiar. I'm sure you guys could all think of other ways too. <laughs> right, Joe? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. <laughs> all right. All right. Praise God. <laughs> so anyway, um, so in Romans 8.26, we'll continue. It says, likewise, the spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought to, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be spoken or uttered. Okay? So they're not an audible thing. But there's their groanings, their inner, their inner dwelling desires of the Spirit of God that begins to minister to us from inside and begins to speak spiritually mysteries of God to us and into our hearts and into our minds that eventually come out in clear conversation and bring forth peace and bring forth direction and clarity for our God is not the God and the author of confusion. Okay? Let's make that really clear. There's a difference between praying in tongues and speaking in tongues. When you pray in tongues, you do that. And if you have the gift of praying in tongues of an unknown language, we speak mysteries to God in our prayer closets, and it builds us up individually, spiritually, as a spiritual house. But in the house of God, let nobody speak. I'd rather that one, Paul said, speak five words of prophecy, for this edifies all the house of God than a thousand words in a tongue without an interpreter, because that edifies nobody. Okay, And if there is someone that speaks in tongues in the church, there must be two witnesses of interpreting. 
to translate it because what it really is in that mannerism, it's actually a dialect in, a, in an actual audible language. That's what happened at Pentecost. It came down and spoke in 15 different languages or so, 13 to 15 different dialects. And all the people said, well, hey, aren't these the Galileans? And we're hearing them speak in our own native tongue. And that was the miracle of Pentecost. Okay? And they spoke it, and everybody clearly understood it. And they said that they were telling of all the great works of God. So guess what? I'm speaking the language from heaven right now. I'm speaking in a tongue that is unknown to the world, but it is known to the household of faith. And you have a pure interpretation from the Holy Spirit of what the Word of God really clear, clarifies and means to us as believers. We must cling to wisdom and not deny somebody the gift that they have to let all things be done orderly and decently in the house of God according to the gospel. Or it's better that you keep silent. So here we go. Praise God. So it says in Hebrews 4.16, it said, Be bold in your prayer, find mercy and grace. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. You know, when you come to the throne of God, what are you doing? You're petitioning him. You're seeking mercy and grace. Okay? So this is a form of prayer. When you come forth to the Lord, the Lord says, draw near to me, and then I'll draw near to you. That's the method. That's how you do it. You got to draw near to the Lord. If you're going to walk with the Lord, right? you got to draw near to him. You're not really walking with him if he's way over there and you're way over here. You can't even yell that far to even hear what each other's saying in the sense, in the physical sense. You know what I'm saying? But in the spiritual sense, when you walk closely with the Lord, he's so near to you that his word is nigh unto thee, even in your very mouth. Oh, I'm thirsty. He's got me. Um, so, um, in 1 Timothy, it speaks of praying with faith. It says, I desire, therefore, that the men pray everywhere, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Okay? People ask us sometimes, you know, they're like, well, why do you lift your hands? Because we're declaring that these hands have been washed in the blood of Christ. And these hands are worshiping God. And we're lifting holy hands and we're praying in supplication and prayer for all saints. And we're praying for all those that are, that are saved and those that are to be saved. And we're not doubting and we're not, we're not wrathful. We're peaceful people. We're loving and kind people. And we lift holy hands without doubting, without um, debating whether God can or can't do anything. Knowing, knowing that God is faithful and also able to do all things. Through Christ, who strengthens us. So, let's continue. Um, pray with the spirit of gratefulness and thanksgiving, as, as spoken of here. And again, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, it says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Psalms 136 says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His love endures forever. Praise God. Remember I said that when I pray to God, a lot of times I'm just thanking him. Why? Because of the great love that he has for us. The great mercy and the patience that he has for me. If God was not as patient as he was, I would be on the highway to hell. But because God is great in mercy and filled with truth and justice, he mercifully justified me at the cross of Calvary by sacrificing his son, my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that I might become the righteousness of God according to his word. 
See, when you receive the Holy Spirit, you begin a conversation because God is always speaking. And that conversation is the Spirit of the Lord and the Word of God and the love of God teaching you to be holy for our Father in heaven is holy. Sanctified, set apart to the will of God. Not lukewarm, not critically judgmental, but filled with grace and truth to the point of obedience of sacrificial living for the namesake of the Lord, which means loving your enemies, praying for those who persecute you unrighteously, loving the hard case people that are hard for others to love so easily. Guess whose job that is? That's our job. That's our responsibility. I think it was Tony, Brother Tony Shukak, he was telling me, someone we were talking about it, um, maybe it was Sean Crabtree, but he was talking about that basically everybody pretty much that Jesus ministered to and healed and did all the miracles to, they were all poor people. They were people that were not allowed to sit amongst the nobles and the Jewish nobles and all those people. They were people that were considered outcasts like us. They were sinners and they were tax collectors and Jesus would go sit with them and he would heal them. And he would feed them. He would love them. And he would tell them of a place that he was going to prepare for them and that he was going to die for their sins. And on the third day rise again and you know what? He came in for 40 days. He came back into the holy city after he rose from the dead and he spoke about the kingdom of his father to the people. That he was taken away in the clouds and ascended into heaven and promised to return. He left as the Lamb of God. He's going to return as the Lion of Judah. All powerful. I'm excited. <laughs> I'm excited. Yeah, praise God. Uh, so here um, it says uh, Give thanks to the Lord for he is good, his love endures forever. Give thanks. To the God of gods, his love endures forever. Keep speaking of the love of God. Okay? Give thanks to the Lord of lords, his love endures forever. 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 2 says this, Therefore I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful or peaceable life in all godliness and reverence for this is good in the sight of the Lord see God puts people in authoritative positions to fulfill his purpose and we need to pray for them and we need to pray the Lord's will and the Lord's blessing upon them the Lord said how is it that man blesses God out of the same mouth that he curses man with. He said, this should never be named once amongst those of the household of faith. This should never be. And if you struggle with that, pray to God to help you with that. Because you're not called to wrath, you're called to blessing. And if you sow a blessing, you're going to reap a blessing, whether they curse you out or not. That still does not make you irresponsible for your part. Okay? You bless them. If they curse you, bless them. If they bless you, bless them. If they feed you, bless them. If they leave you hungry, bless them. If they, if they give you to drink, bless them. If they give, leave you thirsty, bless them. Why? Because you're going to sow the seed of blessing. The word of God is a seed, the Bible says. Okay? So the words of your mouth, the Bible says that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And as the as those who speak the word of God, we are speaking the words that came out of the mouth of God through here. You're either speaking life or you're speaking death. And what can help determine that is your prayer life with God. So I encourage you. And I'm encouraged by you to pray. Amen. Let us pray. 
Father, I just thank you for your word. I thank you for your spirit. I thank you for your presence. I thank you for every provision that you've provided, Lord. Lord, we're a blessed people because of your presence, Lord. We're a grateful people because of the finished work of Messiah at the cross. I just ask, Lord, that every person, Lord, including myself, Lord, would just continue to pray and to believe, Lord, and to pray and ask you, Lord, what is it that would please you, O oh God? in my life, that you would require of me, O oh God, that would bring glory to your name, bring praises from my mouth to you by all times, almighty God, that you would make a habitation of my praise, almighty God, through our conversation in prayer. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, sister, God bless you. We'll see you in a few days.